Hey, it's Tweeter's Digest, the Meta Modern Podcast. Episode 8 Zachary will defend his views. Hey, Zachary, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with me today. Hi, Lupi. Thanks so much for the invite. Yeah, definitely. Uh, all right. Uh, before we get into this stuff, uh, I'd love to know first, what have you been up to lately? Well, I'm living in Dallas right now um, with my parents and um, searching for a job in the animation industry. So the plan is um, when I lock one down, I'll move. I've got my stuff in storage. And until then, I'm just um, on the job search, on the hunt. Um, and just uh, taking things a little slow, enjoying life, um, spending good quality time with my pets and um, watching TV. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nice. Uh, hmm. I'm curious, like, what's your, just at a high level, what, what's your, like, job search process? Well, in the animation industry, um, which I'm learning is the entertainment industry, um, a lot of it's about who you know and um, making connections and um, networking and all that. But the uh, the physical application process is also different than in other um, careers because you need a demo reel, as they call it, which is just a, a really concisely short edited version of like your best work for a very specific kind of job. Um, so each application might need a different type of demo reel. And um, it's a lot of just uh, organizing your work and making decisions on uh, what gets shown and what doesn't. And um, it, it's exciting. And uh, I hope to, uh, to work soon and to uh, um, have a chance to show the world what I've got and all that. But um, the job search isn't always the, the most motivating part. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. Uh, yeah, good luck to you. I, I really enjoyed watching your the uh, the video you made for and with Toshin. Like that was excellent. Um, so I hope you find something soon. Thank you so much. And I, I was blown away by the um, the response to that video's release. And um, when I do get a job, I, I'm sure I'll be able to uh, attribute that, um, if not for making my demo reel better, but just um, showing off just. The, uh, the kind of ambition I've got, the kind of projects I want to put out. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Very cool. All right. Let's, uh, let's read your tweets. On December 14th, 2020, you tweeted, Internal Family Systems is a really curious therapeutic framework I've been applying recently. I've realized that some very minor negative experiences from my childhood, embarrassment at school, fights with family, etc., still indirectly influence my thoughts and actions today. I didn't have the tools to process those negative experiences as a kid, but now I can confront those parts of myself using adult emotional skills. This renders related defense mechanisms, fear of standing out, excessive confrontation aversion, etc., obsolete. Well, um, I've always been fascinated with um, various contemplative practices and just exploring the mind through a uh, lucid dreaming and meditation and uh, all sorts of avenues. And um, I came across internal family systems, which is this story about how your brain works, um, where you can uh, assign different characters with different functions and it's a whole system. And I find it quite useful actually. Um, and uh, it's easy to do yourself or with a therapist. And um, it just, it has some different ways of framing mental blocks and um, focus a lot on like conversations with your past self who didn't have the tools that you have now to deal with difficult emotions and such. Um, and so I, I'm not by any means an expert or a, a spend every day doing IFS training or anything, but um, it's, it's certainly an, an interesting path to explore. And uh, it's, it's right up my alley for the, the kind of things I'm curious to read and learn about. I've learned a bit about IFS myself. I don't have like a, a regular practice or experience with it myself, but I'm curious, could you share like <clears throat> an example of how you've utilized IFS to 
you know, either confront something or make a decision, just some, some personal experience with IFS you, you're willing to share? Sure. Um, I have this, this memory of um, a childhood memory in my old elementary school doing some sort of extracurricular. And um, my, my younger brother was there and he did something, I'm not sure what, and I just got real mad and yelled at him and was made a scene and I uh, just remember feeling embarrassed and like I um, didn't have great control over my anger and just n normal childhood um, emotions and behaviors. But um, for some reason, it's kind of stuck with me. And I think it just emotionally informed like just my development and the way I see the world and interact with things. And um, even though it was such an inconsequential moment. Um, and so one of the early IFS like realizations I made was um, how to look back at that and recontextualize it and look at it with more maturity and um, sort of just resolve some of the things about how I experience anger and um, express it. Um, and so it's not just with um, anger, but that is a, a particular emotion that can like stay, it, it, it holds on to you over time, uh, even if there's no logical reason for it. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm. You said that single experience of anger as a kid, just like kind of like colored, I guess your current, I guess, relationship with anger. I don't know. That's really crazy. Like a single, that, that one time with your brother. Wow. Uh, there was another time as a kid, I, I smashed like a portrait in my room because I was like so mad. Like I just wanted to destroy something, you know, and it's the only time I've ever done something like that. And so it sticks with me as well. And um, I can also revisit that version of me in IFS and have conversations. Um, and just generally my I think I have a, a different relationship to um, anger than the average person. And um, so it, it's just a, a, a real interesting tool. And um, if not a, a therapeutic uh, magic bullet, at least like fun to mess around with. And um, if you're, if you like to think about yourself, be <laughs> introspective. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what, what, I guess, what do you think makes your relationship with anger different from most other people's relationship with anger? Well, I'm, I, in some ways, I, for a while, I thought maybe I didn't experience anger like people generally do. Um, when I'm driving on the highway, I, I don't have the instinct to like get mad at other people in their cars. Like that just seems alien to me. Um, and I don't know, I, I, I come at things sort of analytically and, um, just I, I have an easy way of um, avoiding difficult situations and sometimes in good ways and sometimes in um, like just avoidant ways. Um, and so I, I don't know how to put it into words exactly, but um, I've just I've always felt like I um, I sometimes when I, I hold a grudge, it's all black and white when other people might be more gray and um, when I am angry with someone, like it's not my instinct to want bad things for them. Um, it's hard for me to overcome that, like to, to wish ill on someone as well. So it can be sometimes difficult for me, I guess, to, uh, to uh, express that um, because anger is like, it is a useful emotion, I believe. And it has, it has a function and it can lead to good outcomes and, relationships and conversations. And um, so it, it's just something I'm, I'm trying to develop uh, as a, I, in my early 20s, there's a lot to um, just learn about yourself. And I think childhood has been extended in our current society. Um, so I, uh, I, I tweet things that I think about and I, I find interesting. And if I knew everything about them or had really strong opinions and then I, I wouldn't tweet about them. It's because I want to know more usually. Yeah. When you say all that, like I realize I don't 
have strong expressions of anger myself either. Um, yeah. And, and um, I guess for me, I, I realize like I have an instinctual, instinctual uh, thought process. It's like, well, anger isn't useful for communicating whatever one's desired outcome in a conversation or trying to be persuasive. It's very, um, it, it feels like an expression of like immaturity, maybe like, oh, the only way I can communicate my ideas is through this, this angry outburst. Therefore, my ideas are invalid or because um, um, they can't be communicated you know, logically or calmly. They, they have less, uh, I don't know, seriousness about them. I don't know. It's, it's very interesting. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you mentioned the earlier, like an explanation or interest in other things like meditation or psychedelics. Sorry if I'm for forgetting what exactly you said, but could you uh, mention or say again, like other things in this sort of realm of introspection that you're curious about? Uh, lucid dreaming is, is one habit that I got into um, pretty deeply several times in my life. Um, and I found internet forums with different techniques and um, all that. And I just naturally would have lucid dreams occasionally. But I learned by keeping a dream journal and doing reality checks where I count my fingers to make sure there's still five or I, I try to read words or something and you make that a habit. So when you do that in your dream, you realize, why can't I count my fingers like I normally can? Um, that can be a trigger for realizing, oh, I'm lucid now. I'm in a dream. Um, and when you're in a lucid dream, it's a very powerful psychic state. And there's a lot of exploration you can do with that um, to have conversations with people who have passed or to um, go to a library and read secret knowledge um, that obviously is from somewhere in your cranium, but um, you wouldn't be able to look at that knowledge if you didn't use uh, dreaming as a tool. And we don't fully understand the power and the purpose of dreams and all that. Um, so I, it's, it's definitely a, a mystery, mysterious like curiosity kind of an exploration. Um, and I, I would sometimes have like five very vivid, very memorable, like narratively complex or um, even physically complex, like in four dimensions or with time skips and um, difficult ways to explain how they're, they're like structured, but um, very powerful, like cognitive experiences. And um, uh, I had to stop because I started confusing dreams and reality just a <laughs> little bit too much for comfort. Because um, there'd be times where I would recall like a conversation with someone and not be entirely sure if it really happened. I, I think of dreams almost as poetry, um, where the explicit isn't like what you're experiencing. It's like the um, implied connections and like aesthetics of like the different um, like components that go into something. So let's say um, you have a dream at, like at an amusement park. You're not just literally in an amusement park. You are, you're experiencing the memories and emotions and associations and everything that you have like come to grow about an amusement park inside yourself, if that makes sense. Um, so you're, you're like, um, maybe we can cut this because I, I'm losing my, I, I lost track of between all that troubleshooting of what the question exactly was asking. Sorry. It's fine. <laughs> uh, I was mostly just curious, like um, generally the other wooey type things in your life. I, I happened upon this phrase woo stack recently that I, I quite enjoy. So you have IFS, you have lucid dreams. Um, so just to clarify something, you, you no longer lucid dream because you're too good at it. Is that, is that correct? <laughs> I will still lucid dream just naturally on occasion. And, uh, it's kind of a spectrum of how aware you are here in the dream. Um, sometimes you're a little bit aware, but not enough to control anything. Um, but, uh, I no longer will, um, intentionally keep a dream journal and do reality checks throughout the day and such. Um, 
the the more interesting lucid dreaming technique I ever successfully achieved was um, going straight from wakefulness to lucidity. You don't actually have to like fall asleep in between if there are certain techniques and um, it's, it's, it's wild. <laughs> yeah. It sounds wild. Huh? Okay. Yeah. I was, I was curious then uh, what else is in your woo stack? If anything, do, do you meditate? I, um, my meditation practice is just things I've picked up from a lot of different studies. Um, most recently, just through uh, conversations with the uh, Tasha and Fogelman, I've learned more about uh, loving kindness or meta meditation. Um, but my first introduction was with mindfulness meditation through a, a Sam Harris app or something. And um, I just, uh, meditation is not one thing. I, I thought it was one thing for the longest time, but it's actually like, 24 different things that people are doing and ascribing the same name to. So um, it, it's something I, I can find peace and um, like, I don't know, just a, an inner comfort with how things are through meditation. Um, and it's something I'd like to get better at. Hmm. hmm. Okay. Is, I guess, what, what is getting better at meditation? What would that look like for you? It's a, a very like specific skill or several specific skills um, of just a ways you can make your mind think differently um, that are difficult to describe. But um, with mindfulness meditation, the, the thought of like letting your um, ideas pass as if, as if they were leaves in a stream and you recognize them and accept them and then let them go. And, um, there, there's something to that for sure that I think through many contemplative practices, people have uh, discovered many times. And um, just with the way, it's changing the way that you um, exist in the world and perceive your senses. And um, I don't know, it's a getting better at meditation to me would be allowing myself to put more time into it and um, to leave aside just my um, human distractions and um, like difficult emotions. And um, I don't know, just it, pe people get a lot of different things out of meditation and it's not always the same for me, but um, I never regret going deeper into um, various meditative practices. Yeah, it seems like broadly, one thing people tend to gain from more long saying meditative practice is separating themselves, or if there is a self from uh, different stimuli and experiences in their life. Like they're not their thoughts. They're not their emotions. These are just things that come into their awareness and out. And they don't necessarily necessarily have to like, like ride the roller coaster of a particular thought pattern or some emotional wave they can just like you know watch it come and go for sure that seems like a common like nice long-standing benefit of meditation i notice when i i meditate more and i have um 30 minutes or more to like commit to one session and i do that regularly it it allows me to um even when i'm not meditating see things from a more um a further away perspective where I don't get wrapped up in, um, I guess the stress of the moment as much. And I can see things more for, uh, how they are and to, um, with my, uh, ADHD symptoms as well, just to like focus thoughts into more linear <laughs> patterns, I guess. I find that is a definitely a side effect of meditation as well. Cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, going back to, to IFS, I'm curious, uh, you have the, uh, the anger kind of childhood memories and parts. Um, do you have other parts that correspond to other emotions? They, IFS, I, I associate, I, I don't know all the terminology. I believe it's a, the firefighters is how they label the, um, the aspects of you that develop to like protect you from certain memories or experiences. Um, and so I guess the, 
the sort of emotions and memories that I've explored through IFS are mostly around um, anger, as previously mentioned, and um, just like romantic and personal and just difficulties and relationships in that way. Um, and I guess um, not just my brother, but parent relationship with my parents and um, myself. It's a, I, I'm sounding quite wooey here and um, it, I'm obviously no expert, but um, the, the, the value I got from IFS is just like the story, the uh, how things are structured. It's a different way of looking at um, like your personality and how you um, are put together and whether or not it's true, it's, it's certainly useful. Um, <laughs> and mm -hmm. it's, um, it's exciting and uh, like it satiates just the curiosity as well, which is my main motivator for uh, anything with lucid dreaming or uh, meditation, um, sensory deprivation. Like I just, I want to see what it's like. <laughs> yeah, sweet. Yeah, curiosity is as good of a motivator as any to explore this stuff. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the true versus useful thing made me laugh just like that's the exact rat post rat fight <laughs> so I really just like summarized it pretty succinctly there okay that's great man let's uh let's move on to your next tweet on may 8th 2021 you tweeted uh mom it's not a phase i'm a digital nomad learning in public to cultivate playfulness within emerging meta modern cultural landscapes you wouldn't understand <laughs> That is, it's only half ironic. Um, I, I guess I've been um, on this part of Twitter and familiar with the people who fit that stereotype for a couple of years now. And um, I, I, I do have like a little bit of that aspiration to be like a, a Twitter guy and to think it's like the next big thing and um, like just a, an identity to wear and to... Um, like feel like I'm, I'm doing something like super cool and like the, the boomers don't understand like what the internet, how cool it is and all that. Um, and people are building their careers and social lives and um, like hobbies into the internet and doing new and crazy things and building new kinds of community structures and all that. And um, I, I'm very much uh, excited and like invested in all of that energy myself. Um, but I also, I see it as, um, a, a little funny to, to point at, and, um, some people take things too seriously as well. And so that's sort of, a uh, joking a little bit at myself and, uh, at subtweeting other people as well, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. nice multi-purpose tweet there. Uh, do you think, you know, broadly that sort of career you're pointing towards in the tweet, uh, you know, that could be compatible with your, your animation aspirations just because I know like with, if you end up like in, in a studio that may require, I don't know, more, I don't know, you know, better than me, I'll just let you <laughs> answer that. I do think that there is a value in having an online presence and a, just a personality and perspective on things um, in the entertainment industry generally. And of course they can get you in trouble. Um, old tweets, when they're resurfaced, they're not always this uh, amicable. It often goes terribly. Um, but if you can be professional and people feel like they know you and um, you can build a body of work online, I think all of those things are valuable for uh, animation careers and beyond. So um, I I'd like you to read that tweet back so I can see uh, all the buzzwords I crammed in there. <laughs> um, and maybe I can I can go through them and uh, label how ironic their usage were or how like legitimately unironically I think it's actually pretty cool <laughs> yeah yeah I love it great idea uh the tweet is uh mom it's not a phase I'm a digital nomad learning in public to cultivate playfulness within emerging metamodern cultural landscapes you wouldn't understand so digital nomad is a, a term I see people use in their uh, Twitter bios sometimes, and uh, I get a kick out of it. It's a very good mental image. Um, and 
is, is very self-serious as well, but um, I think it's unironically kind of cool. Um, so a digital nomad, metamodern landscape, is that next? Uh, next is learning in public. <laughs> learning in public, okay. Uh, I'll defend that as well. Um, I, I, I do learn in public and I think it's a, it's a great way to learn, to talk about what you're reading at the time, what YouTube rabbit holes you're consumed with, just put that out into the world and people will like contribute and um, they'll enjoy it. You'll enjoy it. And you can get more out of it using social media connections than you would through um, books and um, documentaries and YouTubers or whatever. Uh, I'm not sure what a meta modern digital landscape is exactly, <laughs> um, but it, it's very flavorful, and it, I think it adds to the uh, the impact of the tweet at least. <laughs> yeah, met, meta modern just a nice kind of nothing, <laughs> right? Uh, right. Cultivate cultivate playfulness is in there as well. Playfulness, yeah. Um, I think playfulness is one of the um, the, like the core traits of the type of like Twitter guy I'm describing there. Um, they like, they're not afraid to um, like be silly online and to, um, at, although they may be self-serious on some level, they are also like meta aware of it as well. And <laughs> <laughs> they've sort of logic themselves into, oh, being playful on Twitter is going to be like so cool for my, um, my brand and my, um, I don't know, social networking and all that. And um, I, I know plenty of people who have words like that in their bio and most of them are pretty great. So, um, and most of them probably retweeted that as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a pretty popular tweet. Um, th this whole thing, I wanna say about it, 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 it's great for everyone who can pull it off. Um, Obviously, you have to have like some nice body of work or proof of ability and like credentials or, you know, from the learning in public, like show off what you can do so that people will believe you and buy into whatever you're, whatever you're shilling. Um, I know like people like get clients or like customers or jobs just through shit posting, which is, which is, <laughs> which is the dream. Well, people will just tweet about introspection or IFS or whatever they're on about in a playful manner and like making connections on Twitter, like just being the stereotype I describe. And um, it becomes their career at a certain point. And they have um, a podcast or they have a, um, like, like a, a mentor, they'll have people pay to talk to them, and, like give advice or mentor them on things. And um, sometimes it, it comes across as grifty or like just a, like, playing into a phase i guess um but other times it, it is legitimately cool and I, i'm generally supportive of that notion um but also it's fun to poke fun at mm -hmm. yeah i think regardless of like one's whatever career tactics or aspirations the, the, the playfulness feels like the right or a right way to be or exist on twitter just because like you know for the most part people are choosing to spend their time there so like why focus on, well, you know, object level, political fights or whatever. And when you just like have fun and like play around in the replies and do silly tweet prompts or whatever, just, just have fun there. If you get a job from it, great. The, the Twitter default is like to treat it like um, a war zone. Everything's combative and um, you're thinking about your enemies quote tweeting you and how you can dunk on them the best and um riling yourself up in righteous anger and um there, there's a time and a place for that but the people who are on twitter to be playful and everything's in jest and they're just like existing and learning in public and um like that is the the part of twitter i want to be on more than the um the the terrible rest of twitter <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah definitely agreed glad we're both there yeah, let's, let's go on to your next tweet. On June 1st, 2021, you tweeted, Happy Pride Month 2021. I don't tweet about it much, but I am bisexual and proud. 
Gender and sexuality are malleable social constructs, which together we can remold to create a happier, more loving world. So I, I am bisexual. Um, I lean more into attractions to women, but um, uh, guys, are good. guys are pretty cool too. Um, and uh, I don't know if I had tweeted about that before, but uh, I felt like it was an important enough part of my personality to just put out there um, so people are aware. And um, I do have just a, an ideology on gender and sex and just pretty progressive on all that. And um, just wanted to sort of like put out a, a statement that um, if when people search like Zachary Hunley bisexual later, that'll show up and be like, oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to go ahead and DM him anyways. Um, I don't know. The, uh, I, I've never felt the like direct connection to the LGBTQ community as, um, as many people have, like it's there for them in their childhood. And it like forms like various difficult transitions in their lives and conversations with family and all that. And, um, I've always been pretty accepted and comfortable with all of that. And, um, uh, not, it's not something that I, I talk about or, um, like make a big deal about on Twitter, I suppose but I felt weird having never mentioned it. And um, Pride Month was just a, a good opportunity for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. I uh, guess I was curious just if you have anything else you wanna share about um, your sexuality as it relates to just your life, history, anything. Um, I don't know, just like hearing people's personal identities and their experiences like this. So anything that comes to mind or surfaces, just love to hear about it. Um, one thing I've, I've thought about recently is how being a bisexual man is quite socially acceptable and maybe even like, um, gives you clout on some level in like modern day college. Um, the, like, if you're in a, a young progressive college community, um, really any college like that is, has people who are accepting of those lifestyles and such, um, it's it's not a thing that will turn off like straight girls, like it kind of used to. It's not like super uncool or whatever. Um, and that's, I, I get the impression that that's a, a very new like social dynamic where like bi guys can be cool. Um, and so I, I guess I, I, I like to be open about that sort of thing. And um, I just, to, to be honest and be myself and, um, not afraid of people's reactions and all that. And, um, I, I also like, I'll defend my, um, my views on gender and sex. And, um, I like to have those out there when there are opposing views that are, are quite popular, uh, shared in this space of Twitter as well. And so, um, sort of just standing my ground and, um, uh, giving people a, an opportunity to learn more about me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Mentioning college, I'm curious, we can, we can cut this if it's uh, too personal, but I'm aware you went to a relatively conservative uh, public U.S. college. Um, so I'm curious if the most you're... The most conservative. Really? Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it, it scores like highest for uh, Texas A&M is like the most conservative college campus or at least in the top three, but it's still a college campus. Um, and I was in an animation um department so everyone has blue hair and piercings and pronouns and all that um so i i can't say it's true for every university in the country um there might be some like private christian universities that are aren't like this but i, I can say even in the south the deep south like uh, agriculture school um the lgbt community is like still pretty powerful and um like you, you can live your life um, how you like, and you'll find people who support you and accept you. Sweet. Yeah, I didn't didn't realize that even about A&M. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Is there anything I want to mention about um, your thoughts about gender, um, your viewpoint there? I've always felt a little constrained by, like, male gender roles and um, just how you're expected and taught to express your masculinity. Um, I find that just like, despite its its value in certain levels, it's also 
constraining. I think it causes a lot of pain and repression and um, just un unhealthy thoughts and inter interactions and relationships and all that. And that, that's pretty like bog standard, like um, feminist viewpoint that masculinity is like a box. And um, I, I found that by being openly bisexual, I'm given a little like wiggle room where I can lean more into like my femininity and um, not have to like put on the same macho mask that a lot of people do. And uh, with age and time and research and just learning more about how much of gender is socially constructed and how much it's changed over time and the different ways that it can be expressed and um, just as a social technology and um, just a way of structuring society, it's not fixed. And we've got a lot of problems and we've got a lot of solutions. I don't know all the right solutions, but I, I've seen just amazing progress in my lifetime. Um, and wow. as well as um, legal victories uh, for gay marriage and such like that. So um, I think that it is a very relevant issue, um, especially with a lot of the stuff that's going on in my state and other states right now with uh, transgender bills being passed. And so um, I just, I wanted to send out that message of like my alignment with the idea of gender, like not being this um, like innate, unchangeable um, fact of life that we have to work with and how it is, it's more a tool that as a group, we can work to make better fit our society. And there's good, and bad ways to do that, but I think we need to do it and we are doing it. So I, that, that's the, the impetus of that suite, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Um, I'm curious, could you go into some detail about, um, you mentioned um, being bisexual, you're more able to explore or behave in a feminine manner. Could you, could you go into for you personally, how you sort of embrace or embody femininity? Um, let's see. I, I think the, the labels of like femininity and masculinity are, are already so like gray and fuzzy and, um, changing over time and where you are in the world as well. But, um, I guess some of my more feminine traits are my, um, my patience and empathy and, um, um, I don't know. I have a, like a gentleness to me and a lot of the ways that I, I make friends and I have conversations is I think more on that side of the access. Um, and I'm not afraid to express my love for like, um, hyper feminine, like pop music or, um, like wear pink and purple and all that. And I, I'm just not afraid of like bumping into feminine, um, indicators because like I'm bi anyways, like people, some people might think that I'm going to be like a, a soy boy or whatever anyways. And I, I'm not ashamed of that. So I, I just think that the LGBT community is, is more accepting of um, people who are more free in their expression um, on that access and just adopting that identity and, um, befriending other people with similar identities and related ones and all that has just only been good for like my self-confidence and, um, how I, uh, how I view myself and, um, enjoy just relationships. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. So glad to hear all that. Um, hmm. yeah, my current best sort of understanding or framework for like masculine and feminine, I've been like yin and yang pilled lately. Um, which don't have, I don't think, direct translations into English, but broadly, yang is like masculine action-based behavior or identities, and yin is more feminine, intuitive, receiving sort of behaviors and identity. I believe um, some people will throw out the baby with the bathwater, and they'll be angry about how the, the world works with sex and gender, and they want to throw it all out and build something new in its place. And um, I think there's, there's things you should keep as well. 
and that femininity and masculinity are important in society and like um they, they shouldn't be abandoned i'm not like an abolitionist but um there's definitely room for improvement and uh, expansion and all that and um like i i do consider myself a quite masculine man as well as the the feminine aspects mm -hmm. yeah they're definitely like way more modes of masculinity beyond the stereotypes of like macho jim bro uh you know anger or <laughs> very like you know taking up a lot of space there's so many different ways to be masculine besides those those default stereotype ways right mm -hmm. and i i think it's generally a good thing when harry styles wears a dress or um tom holland like uh does like a, a drag dance on that one tv show or whatever like um that stuff is like it's it's funny and it's cool and it's like clearly everyone's having a great time but in another in another age it would be seen as shameful or um destructive to society and um it's just good to see i guess progress over time especially um just in the last 20 years mm -hmm. yeah those examples are both really powerful too because i think you're referring to tom holland's like umbrella performance maybe or, yes yeah um they're they're clearly great both song. Yeah, they don't express any or display any shame or like lack of confidence about how they're choosing to display themselves, um, which feels like, you know, with masculine or feminine expressions, like how you want to be is like embrace who you are. Don't try and be afraid of expressing yourself, whether it's, you know, more feminine as a man or more masculine as a woman. Um, yeah, that right. feels like an important aspect of you know, this progress we're seeing with uh, these aspects of gender expression. I think there's a, an acceptable and valuable level of like coercion and peer pressure and such to fit gender roles and have better results. I'm not like totally um, denying of like how that functions. It's just um, like, it feels like there are a lot of downsides which are quite like readily, like everyone kind of knows um, just feminist ideology and um, just the, if you ask any random guy on the street, he's going to say a lot of the same things that I'm saying. Um, it just, it's good to have that increased awareness. And I, I'm optimistic that in the future, there will be even fewer like boys who feel low self-confidence and this um, like fear that's driving their identity as opposed to expression. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Hope so. Okay. Uh, next tweet. Thank you for sharing all that, by the way. Thanks for asking. On September 20th, 2021, you tweeted, ADHD meds hit so hard, I remembered my Webkin's password. <laughs> I still crack up thinking about that. Uh, I might be the number one fan of my own tweets. <laughs> um, I, I was diagnosed with a ADHD recently and uh, uh, I'm on Adderall now. So, um, and <laughs> one thing Adderall will make you do is want to tweet more, I've noticed. And um, I, I thought that was just the most hilarious thing at the time and I still do, but um, uh, I can think more like a normal person now. My, my thoughts are more structured and less, um, like, I'm less easily distracted when I'm medicated, and I'm more able to just have that executive functioning back that uh, I see people just naturally have. And so um, I, I would recommend people who suspect they have ADHD, but they were never diagnosed as a child. Um, you can look into it, and uh, you might get some benefit out of treatment and medication. But um, you'll also, like... <laughs> It super charges your brain. Like the, the joke is that I remembered something from my childhood of like a password that I didn't from like a website I played with when I was like eight or 10 or so. Um, and so that didn't literally happen. But um, especially when you first start with a, a stimulant medication for um, an attention disorder, like <laughs> there's a rush of dopamine and um, just that making new connections and it's the uh i guess i'll backtrack here the the experience of um 
being treated for my ADHD symptoms for the first time. Um, it's just a, a, it's a remarkable experience. And um, there, there's a, a sort of humorous and um, semi-ironic like uh, boost in how like intelligent or able to make connections and things you are. And um, I, I don't always have the greatest memory. So um, that's what, sort of what I'm joking about there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, could you share uh, how the like symptoms of ADHD manifested in your life most strongly, I guess, like growing up or throughout your life? Well, I've always been one to um, lose items. My lunchbox had to be replaced many a time in elementary school. And um, I'll always run back from the car to grab my wallet that I forgot. Just general, just um, disorganization. Um, but one of the actually most like life affecting symptoms is my uh, inability to like make phone calls. I've got this anxiety tied into it and I'll just immediately forget like the important bullet points that I have to cover in a phone call if I don't like rehearse them beforehand. Um, but I found now that um, when I medicated, it is so much more natural for me to organize my thoughts and like express myself over the phone without that physical um, thing. Like in, in person, it's fine. It's just something about not seeing someone's face when I'm talking to them. And um, it's a, a common ADHD thing to just sort of fall apart and no longer be an effective communicator. Um, and so uh, I'm now a lot less anxious around phone calls and um, I'm not, I don't find myself like reaching for um, what I wanted. Like I, it's just, it's way more natural for me to communicate that way now. And um, that is one of the bigger things for sure. Yeah. Wow. I never realized that about the phone call thing. Like it can like just uh, personifying someone's brain. Just like if you're not seeing the person, you're like seeing other like stimuli. Just why are you saying things to no one? <laughs> A uh, non-medicated right. ADH ADHD might, might rationalize. Wow. Wow. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's so interesting. Wow. I didn't, I didn't realize that was, that was a thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What was your process, like the timeline for getting like diagnosed and medicated? I know it can be in the U.S. Um, a bit like fraught or drawn out. I'm just curious about if you're willing to share the, uh, the process view of um, getting diagnosed yeah. and all that. Well, um, it, it's always been a bit of a suspicion. Like I, I've had symptoms my whole life, but they were never just um, something like I saw I needed to go to a doctor for. Um, my brother was diagnosed and um, it was good for him and all, but I just didn't have the same like difficulties in school until college and just the end of college with online classes, having to manage my own time instead of um, physically walking into a building and having someone else like lecture you directly. You have to wake yourself up and um, make, remind yourself of all your assignments and just it's a lot more executive functioning for um, being in college during COVID than it was beforehand. And um, so I, I sought out a psychologist and um, they, I think they're a little bit of a pill mill, I think, where it's easy to get a diagnosis and they just throw medication at you. Um, but I, I do have a legitimate diagnosis now as well. And um, I, I'm pretty convinced I, I do genuinely have that neurotype. Um, and just, I relate to a lot of the experiences of people who have um, adult ADHD diagnosis. And um, I find it easier to just function now. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So, so you were diagnosed multiple times, is that true? I was um, prescribed Adderall before my official diagnosis. Hmm. And um, then later went into like a more extreme screening with professional and all that and um, got my confirmation that I, I do legitimately have ADHD. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Next tweet on February 27th, 2022, you tweeted. It's sensible to assume my relative inactivity on Twitter lately is due to freelance animation deadlines and or mental health. Truth is, though, 
I'm just stockpiling raw observations so I can pretend to be cool at Vibe Camp. Yep, that's uh, that's accurate. Um, I, I was working on this crazy ambitious project, and I was putting all this time into it and stressing and just um, really pushing myself. Um, but that had nothing to do with uh, my absence from Twitter. I just uh, I wanted to seem cooler at Vibe Camp, and you gotta like make a list of these tweets and then just say them in person and pretend you came up with them in the moment, right? <laughs> so yeah, that, that's just what I did there. And I felt bad about um, not mentioning it. Like people might wonder where I went. So I had to say something. <laughs> <laughs> your, your absence was, was felt. Right. Yeah. Uh, from this, I, I was curious to know, was Vibe Camp your first uh, experience of meeting many Twitter people like more than you know, one or a few um, at once in some physical space? It was, um, and it was many people, 400 or so. Um, previously, I've only just met up with people in one-on-one -on -one or smaller meetups with people I, I didn't know as well from online. But um, Vibe Camp as an event was just like so much more than that. And um, I was a little bit on like a manic high for most of vibe camp just like uh like so happy to be meeting all these people that i i recognize from the little circles on my phone and um just wanted to meet as many of them as possible even though you could never meet all of them in that short time um and uh i had such a blast at vibe camp mm -hmm. yeah um is there anything you want to share uh more detail about uh your experience there i'm just curious like how is it for you anything that comes to mind from that there was a novelty hat from an inside joke that ended up on the Vibe Camp merch store. Um, it's the the one that says, please be patient, I'm cozy, or something <laughs> along those lines. Um, and uh, not everyone at the event recognized it, but it's just a, a well-made enough hat, and it's, it's pretty funny. Um, and I, I had the idea to get signatures on it with a Sharpie. And so I spent like the last um, half of camp just meeting people and instantly having a conversation starter about how they should sign my hat. Um, and uh, I joked to many of them about selling it as an NFT someday. And that might not be a joke. <laughs> I might sell it. But um, there, there's hundreds of names on there from like Twitter micro niche celebrities and all that. And um, it's a very cool collector's item at the very least. Wait, hundreds? The hat's not that big. There's gotta be around 200 signatures that's my best estimation they're very small underneath on the brow um deep fates wrote it on the like adjustable like strap on the back because he just had to um, and oh, i think oh, shit. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. <laughs> i think bungo man has the biggest signature but um uh, i if i if i had a bunch of free time to throw into this this is my ultimate dream is to take a bunch of pictures at different angles and like photogrammatically or using photogrammetry, like make a 3D model that people can spin around and zoom in at all the names and they can click on them and like take them to their Twitter profile. And like, I, I just make like a neat website and I show the hat and then I, when I sell it as an NFT and I can just retire off the funds from that because it is so valuable. Um, that, that's my, my aspiration, my dream. We don't know. I don't know if I'll get around to it, but, um, <laughs> it, it was something, it's something fun to tell people and get their signature and have them hype you up for it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. I think you're set financially. This, this animation stuff just kind of to, to fill time at this point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder if dot hat is a, whatever, a top level domain, if you could like an NFT dot hat or teapot dot hat or something. <laughs> It's got to be, or dot cap, maybe. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's cool, man. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, glad uh, Vibe Camp was a really cool, novel experience. I know this case for, for many of us, the attendees. Okay, uh, and speaking of cozy, let's, let's go on to your next tweet here. On March 18th, 2022, you tweeted, we cannot tell the precise moment when cozy is formed. As in filling a vessel drop by drop, there is, at last, a drop which makes it run over. So in a series of kindnesses, there is at last one which makes the heart run cozy. 
I read that, um, in a book, it's a quote <laughs> from some famous author and <laughs> I substituted the word. I, I put cozy in there. I don't quite remember what it used to say, but, um, I just thought it was a, a powerful thing and, uh, I connected with it and I can, um, just push in this idea of coziness. The, uh, just, I, I don't even know exactly what coziness is online, but, um, it's, uh, it's the, the same inside joke behind that hat and, um, just something I knew that people would, uh, appreciate. And, um, so I just sent that tweet out and I think people liked it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Damn. I was going to ask what cozy is to you, but if you don't know, then <laughs> well, coziness is it's, <laughs> it's a vibe. It's an aesthetic. Um, if you try to like point at it, it disappears. Um, and it's also a little elitist. Like you don't know what cozy is. Like, I'm not going to explain coziness to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I think I was curious to think about this tweet. Uh, it is really funny by the way, obviously. Um, I was wondering just broadly beyond the, the Twitter aesthetic and whatever exclusivity stuff, if, it's more of a, a reaction to external stimulus, like you're cozy through your environment or, and, and, or if it's more of a state of mind, like could someone be cozy, like in hell, if they have the right attitude, <laughs> um, you have any, any thoughts about that, that, that maybe false dichotomy I, I just put up there. I think coziness fundamentally is a state of mind but you have, to, you have to interact with the real world and you have to acquire certain objects to like truly um, embody the coziness. So you could be cozy in hell, but it'll be a lot easier if you buy yourself a weighted blanket or you make yourself warm tea. <laughs> um, or if you, if you reference cozy in tweets, it's just like pushing them in there, that's cozy as well. Um, it's a... <laughs> It's definitely a vibe and a joke, but um, it's also, it can be like a, a, a motivator for just living a better and more comfortable life as well. What is your coziest animation? Oh, I mean, it's probably the most recent music video with Toshin. Um, I think it has a very um, playful energy and um, I think his, his heartfelt intentions really come through. And um, the visual style that we developed um, by working with each other is just like very effective at um, portraying like what we were going for. Um, it's not um, it's not cozy in the sense that he's wrapped up in a blanket because he, he's running around, he's being very active and doing things. But um, the, I guess the coziness of his personality and uh, his mission and all that, uh, if it's the cozy the cozy box fairly well. Cool. That was all I had. Appreciate you taking the time to chat here, Zachary. Uh, before we wrap up, I just have one last question, which is what are your favorite things about your Twitter experience? I, it's gotta be just the people I have met through Twitter. Um, the platform itself is great and there are amazing conversations that happen on there and so much you can do with Twitter. But ultimately, it's a way to connect with other real people who are behind the keyboards. And um, just being able to um, grow friendships and get to know just fantastic people from online and then bring those relationships into real life. That's just um, definitely the, the value that I'm getting out of Twitter predominantly. Um, I just, I, I've met so many just incredible people. And um, beyond just the, the personal level of like really getting to know someone, you can have a, a shallower just Twitter relationship with it's based on puns and inside jokes and references. And um, it's another just like really um, fascinating and um, like enjoyable way to um, just interact online. Um, I, I think I got my internet like I got my chops originally on Reddit just as a teenager. And that was my uh, like main social media usage, but it's so impersonal and I never paid attention to anyone's usernames. And um, 
just got sick of just the same ask reddit threads over and over again and lame inside jokes and um realized that twitter isn't just like a place i can throw out my silly ideas to my like irl friends it's also a way i can meet new people and have a intellectual communities and um like just subcultures and scenes and all the people doing all sorts of things it's just a it's a one of the benefits of living in the modern world is that we have access to that mm -hmm. yeah yeah easy access to all sorts of different personalities initiatives what people focus on it's getting like little micro slices of all these different ways of being is yeah it's really amazing uh, I'm curious, like you said, on Reddit, uh, you got your chops. Uh, did you hang out in any particular subreddits? Like, where were you, where were you hanging out on Reddit, if anywhere in particular? Um, I was a big fan of the pop heads and indie heads subreddits, which are just um, like for music exploration and discovery, and um, uh, as well as the uh, Slate Star Codex subreddit I was on for a while, just because I. I was uh, reading the blog a lot at the time and uh, a lot of interesting conversations and um, just ways of um, like talking about current issues as well as I thought that that's a very interesting community perspective that they have. Um, and also just TV shows and books and games that I'm into. I, I love to go to the subreddit and see what the, the fandom is like. And um, it, there's more to just watching a tv show now than there used to be like now you've got like a bunch of nerds who are completely devoted to that tv show and even if you're not one of them you can still just uh, get the value from the work that they've put in um so uh but it was never as personal or as um like relationship based as twitter is um it's more like a lot of self-promotion and um like i don't know it, it's it's more anonymous mm -hmm. yeah reddit stuff feels more focused on like the topic or the content or the media versus twitter can veer into more you know person and relationship focused whatever conversations and discussions right um and also just like the demographics like reddit is uh predominantly like 20s white guys uh, or whatever and I'm sure that's a pretty big demographic on Twitter as well. But um, the, there's a certain type of person who like uses Reddit, and um, they're everyone uses Twitter. Mm -hmm. That they do. Okay, yeah. Uh, thanks again for taking the time to talk with me, Zachary. Uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much for having me on. You too. Yeah. Take care.